thank you all for joining us this afternoon on May 1st and welcome to the 2023 Vermont Organics Recycling Summit organized by the Composting Association of Vermont in partnership with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. This year's summit is being held as a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts on May 7th. International Compost Awareness Week is the largest and most comprehensive education initiative of the compost industry. And the theme this year is for healthier soil, healthier food, compost. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the, Re the Composting Association of Vermont. I'd like to start by thanking all of our fabulous sponsors who allow us to offer this program free of uh, charge to you all. That includes the Community Bank, Eco Products, Nature Cycle, Vegware, Vermont Natural Ag Products, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies, the Vermont Produce Program from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, RMI, and Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. So for today's program, this first program, uh, Deputy Commissioner John Schmelzer will start us off with opening remarks, and then we'll move into the state of the state of organics in Vermont from Alyssa Eichler. And this will be followed by our keynote presenter, Brenda Platt from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which will start at 1.30. Brenda Platt directs the Composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, where she has worked for over 35 years. Her current focus is advancing a distributed composting infrastructure that encompasses composting at homes, community gardens, farms, and other venues. She has authored numerous reports, including Stop Trashing the Climate and Growing Local Fertility, a guide to community composting, and has worked on local, state, and federal policy to support composting. Brenda is a trained composter and trains others, and she is nationally known for her work documenting the jobs through reuse, recycling, and composting. In 2017, the U.S. Composting Council awarded her its H. Clark Gregory Award for outstanding service to the composting industry through grassroots efforts. In 2022, the U.S. EPA recognized ILSR for its co community composting work. Brenda has a BS degree in mechanical engineering from the George Washington University. And Brenda, thank you so much for being with us this year. We're really looking forward to your keynote, so please take it away. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for all of you for joining us today. So um, I could have come up with any variety of titles for my talk today, but I came up with Keep It Local for Better Compost. And uh, let me just say a word about the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Local's in our name. We, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a national research and educational nonprofit organization. We promote healthy communities through local again, the word local, local economic development, and fighting corporate concentration and monopoly power. And I am pleased to share with you that today is our 49th birthday. We turn 50 next year. Um, but basically, we believe that democracy really can only thrive when economic and political power is widely dispersed. So we fight against for example, the outsized power of monopolies like Amazon, and we advocate for keeping local renewal renewable energy in the community that produced it. That's the same thing we bring to our work in organics recycle, recycling. Now we work in pivotal um, sectors. Um, we work in uh, energy, we work in waste, we work in community broadband, fiber optic networks, and we work in, in retail. And one thing I wanna share with you is that we have been tracking Vermont on a number of these key issues for many years, if you go to our website and you type in Vermont, you'll have more than 44 hits. And so the state, for instance, has um, policies that support distributed solar development, despite not having as sunny a locale as you know, other states. Um, the state has been a leader in promoting community broadband networks that connect people in dozens of cities. Vermont has more small businesses per capita than any other state. One of the, the biggest issues in the retail sector is the rise of Amazon and the power it has over the, the marketplace. And uh, my colleague, Stacey Mitchell, has been doing a lot of work on this. She's traveled to Vermont many times um, to talk about that, the scale, 
the reach and the ambitions of Amazon pose real threats to, to Main Street. It erodes competition. They're expanding into other areas besides retail. And some of these um, issues is what I'm going to relate to the work we are doing today in organics recycling. There is a connection. But before I move on, let me just say um, that one of the things that we've our my colleagues have noticed my myself i and my colleagues have noticed that there's an incredible civic infrastructure in vermont you have lots of community organizations and they're just not not just the formal kind of like statewide nonprofits, but also local grassroots groups people organize you put together meetings you really do things um there is a, a lot of social and civic capital that seems to really exist in your state. And I think that this really speaks to the importance of a kind of hands on democracy and the role that we really all have to to play in, in shaping the world in which we want to live. So back to just sharing a little bit of, of um, the things we've documented in Vermont, there was a report I did many years ago in the late 1990s called Don't Throw Away That Food. And we had a number of case studies, maybe a dozen, and at least two of those were based in Vermont. It was um, Middlebury College was one, and I think Fletcher Healthcare might have been another. But the Institute for Local Self-Reliance was really the first to demonstrate that 25% recycling was possible, followed by 40%, followed by 50%. We wrote the first national zero waste agenda for action we've been an early voice for zero waste planning and for not throwing away our food um, and one of the reports we did close to 10 years ago now growing local fertility a guide to community composting we did in partnership with the former vermont based um, highfield center for for composting and that report had 31 case studies, and I think at least six of them were based in Vermont. They were schools, they were farms, um, they were other um, community-based um, activities and projects. And it kind of underscored that community composting, keeping it local, is not just something we can do in cities in urban areas, but there's um, huge potential to do this in rural communities as well. Now, our latest report is one that we just released uh, in late March. Um, it's a kind of a second in a, in a series, if you will, about dollar stores and the dollar store invasion. We, one of the things that we're doing is fighting the proliferation of dollar stores. We've been an outspoken crit critic of Dollar General and similar chains. And last year, this, this new report we released last year showed that nearly half of the new stores that open in the US were chain dollar stores. And that is a degree of momentum with really no parallel in the history of the retail industry. At the start of 2022, Dollar General and Dollar Tree, which owns Family Dollar, by the way, together operated more than 34,000 stores in the US, more than McDonald's, Starbucks, Target, and Walmart combined. Ponder that for a second. And in cities, it's common to find dollar stores clustered by the dozen within certain neighborhoods. But dollar stores have likewise overrun much of rural America. And in some small towns, they seem to be the only retail left. Now, both corporations intend to get intend to get much bigger. Over the last four years, Dollar General has added about 3,500 locations, bringing its roster closer to 18,000 stores and really cementing its status as the largest retailer in the US. And they both plan to grow their combi combined empires to more than 51,000 outlets. So why, why am I mentioning this here today? And that's because it's growing in Vermont too. I think Vermont has more than three dozen dollar stores and it's um, not a business just so happens to be really popular in Vermont. We're talking about a company with an aggressive growth strategy. And what do you think is gonna happen with more dollar stores? There's gonna be more packaging, perhaps less healthy food, perhaps less local food. You know, at best dollar stores, when it comes to food have frozen waffles, the best food, I mean, you know, canned peaches maybe, but there really is a connection between the battle against the proliferation of dollar store chains and the goal to recycle organics and protect our stories. And, and what is that connection? They are both part of the food system. So these, these issues are really connected in my mind. 
Uh, when we look at the challenges to advancing organics recycling, and this is these are not particularly to Vermont. If it was, Alyssa, I would add bears for sure to this list. But what we've seen is lack of infrastructure, lack of access to land that may not be an issue in Vermont, funding and financing, certainly permitting and zoning and other kind of policy and institutional support, big issue for advancing composting. Contamination, we're going to talk about that today and this week. But also another big challenge is rules that favor disposal and or that privilege large industrial sites or companies. And I would submit to you or rules that don't prevent that privileging. Um, and one of the things we're seeing at play here is a lack of a holistic food systems approach, which is kind of why I started with our vision for self-reliant communities and strengthening local economies scale matters, ownership matters, um, and uh, having local as a as a as a holistic framework for a food systems approach could could make a big difference in uh, the infrastructure that we end up with. Now, a number of years ago, I was keynoting a conference in New England, probably in 2008, 2009. And Jerry Powell, who some of you may know, he's um, been in the recycling world and runs Resource Recycling Magazine for many years. He keynoted the first day and he said, the most important five letter word to recycling is, if any of you can guess what that might've been back 2009, it was China because that's where the markets were. And the next day I keynoted the second day which focused on organics. And you know, this is again, like 15 years ago. And I said, what's the most important five letter word to composting? And at that time, I came up with local. And I will submit to you that I still think that is still the most important five letter word to composting is keeping it local. And you may say why I'm not going to read all of these reasons, but there are many. I would say that some of the most important to bring out today is that you can build smaller size facilities, farm scale, community scale sites, home comp encourage more home composting quicker and cheaper and more in line with community values um, you can engage the community in the process if you keep it local the final product i think will have be have higher quality less contamination um, if you're home composting you're not going to willfully put contaminants in your backyard bin the same with if you're composting at a community garden or a farmer who's doing it isn't going to add contaminants. They're going to care about the quality of that compost. Um, and it's also going to make its way back to local soils for local food pr production. So there's many reasons why local composting should be preferred. Now, what is community composting? And, you know, community composting is really a subset of local. You could have on site composting, organics recycling at uh, convention centers or hotels, but universities, but it might not actually be defined as community composting. And the way we look at it is community composting is the not so radical idea that the compost is used within the same community where the material is generated and that that community participates in some way, is engaged in some way. And that report I mentioned that we did, Growing Local Fertility, a guide to community composting, that was actually done, I think, in 2014. That was the first to identify some guiding principles of community composting, which is it's locally based, it's closed looped, it's community scaled, meaning systems are scaled to meet the needs of a self-defined community. Um, the compost programming engages and educates the community in food systems thinking, resource stewardship, community sustainability. The other thing we're finding with community composting is that it really promotes social inclusion and empowerment. Composting at the local level is a direct way to be active in caring for the earth and our community. Uh, neighbors come together for a common cause. They're improving the social fabric of their community. Now, when we look at the EPA food recovery hierarchy, which I understand is under review right now, and it's been around, I don't know how long, but at least a decade or more. You know, we, we want to reduce food waste, we want to rescue food to feed people, feed animals. But then we have industrial uses and conversion to energy, and then we have composting, and then least preferred is landfilling and, and trash incineration, of course. But there's no lens in this hierarchy that addresses the issues of local, 
or high quality or who owns it or what the, how the community is being benefited. And when you look at um, the hierarchy that's, I think, been codified in Vermont law, it's quite similar. You've got the reduction feed people feed animals, but then you've got composting or anaerobically uh, anaerobic digestion together here, at least at least you got Vermont did not put AD above composting. Um, but we look at this and I think, my goodness, there's lots of ways to compost. Uh, farm scale, on site, uh, lots of sizes, home composting at schools. And shouldn't that be included in the hierarchy in terms of what's prioritized? And let me just say a word about home composting because I think home composting is really undervalued. I'm so happy to hear that um, there is what 85% of Vermonters compost. And I missed Alyssa how many of those are actually home composting. So I'll have to look at your data. But with home composting too, there are so many options. We did this report a few years ago called Yes in My Backyard. It's actually a home composting guide for local government, not for the home uh, people at home. But we found that home composting is undervalued and more important than previously thought. Um, the potential to expand is largely untapped but massive, and it needs to be prioritized. It needs to be resource, resourced. We found that local governments can incentivize citizens to compost. They can provide training. They can provide guidance. They can provide equipment. They can um, uh, provide exposure to best practices. One of the obstacles to people home composting to home composting is the per perception of odors and smells and you know rodents or raccoons or maybe in, in Vermont's case bears. But if you set people up for success, they will do it. And if you're, as I said before, if you're composting in your backyard, you're going to not have contamination as much as a problem. And that black gold is going to end up back in your in your local soils as well. So what about local? What about scale? What about diversity? So we created this this kind of new hierarchy that looks at the lens of, of local and what is preferred. Again, it's kind of similar, most preferred, least preferred. So we have source reduction, rescue edible food for people and for livestock, but then we have home composting. Um, and after that, we have small scale decentralized. And note, that it's on-site composting or anaerobic digestion. We think, a lot of us think of anaerobic digestion as being these large-scale facilities, but digesters can be small-scale too, farm-scale, community-scale, um, uh, on-site at, at restaurants. We've seen some examples of that, and, and as well as large-scale. But, um, and then there's medium-scale, locally-based, this could be larger farm-scale, Etc. So um, this may not be so applicable to most of Vermont, but this is a graphic we put together, um, kind of illustrating the closed loop of community compost composting. This graphic, we have a bike hauler, which can work in a lot of urban cities, and we have probably close to three dozen members of our national community composter coalition who are actually collecting on on uh, bikes. I have some pictures I'll share with you. But essentially, what it is is um, whether it's urban composting, community composting, or on-farm composting, you're facilitating the return of the nutrients from the food scraps back into our soils, creating this more circular, self-reliant food systems. And when we're um, doing this uh, within, uh, within our farming community, whether it's rural or urban on-farm, there's just countless benefits. Um, farmers, as well often have equipment that can be repurposed for composting, not to say that they don't need investment to buy new equipment, but they may be able to produce compost less expensively than purchasing soil amendments. They can tailor their composting recipes for their specific needs. Um, and it provides additional sources of income for farmers, tipping sales of the product, and an opportunity to engage the community. And as I mentioned again, you'll keep hearing me say this, contributes to a circular food system. And very important is not having all our eggs in one basket when it comes to composting infrastructure. So we need a network of on-farm composters to diversify our infrastructure. So I'm 
I'm coming to you based in my office in Maryland, not too far from the District of Columbia. And so I have the pleasure of working with a lot of operators in my region. One of them is Compost Crew. They're a food scrap collection service, not only in Maryland, but Virginia and, and DC. And they partner with a network of farms to compost the material. They're building these um, compost out, outposts and largely they're being made from modified shipping containers. Each unit has two bays and they have three sites in Maryland and they've contracted with three more uh, coming up in this, this summer. And one thing that's interesting thing about this model is that it takes a significant amount of the responsibility related to compost it, composting off the shoulder, the farmer's shoulder. So some of the farms like one acre farm in Maryland, you know, they have heavy clay soil, they want the compost, they want to use it. They have the land, but they don't want to operate the composting system. At another farm, Butler Orchard, they are actually running the composting system and comp compost crews delivering the material and, and helping remove con contaminants before it goes in. So there's no one way to do it. And I think that's the beauty of composting is it is so flexible and comes in so many um, sizes and shapes. So I want to share with you this Austrian model. And these next few slides come from Florian Amlinger of Austria, where a decentralized network of over 350 composting facilities serve the country's roughly 8 million residents. And so they're basically, the result of that is they're composting about 300 pounds per person uh, per year. But Florian has developed organic source separation and composting systems in rural areas that involve farmers and the agricultural sector um, with on-farm composting. But really the goal is elevating farmers in the organics recycling supply chain and providing them business opportunities. And one of the, the things that I think as this is rolled out in, in Austria is that the farmers were setting the specs for the compost and the composting process, not the other way around. Um, so yard waste and uh, food scraps, which in Austria they call bio waste, the food scraps, they're collected from all residences and contamination is screened very closely. And depending on the enragement, farmers sometimes collect the material kind of pictured here, but sometimes it's dropped off at a relatively more centralized location and sorted. Does this sound so familiar with some of the examples in Vermont? Um, but the material is taken to this network of more than 400 facilities for, for composting. And of the 400, 280 are farms, that's 69%. So what, what is needed, you know, um, and not just in Vermont, but you know, how can we expand on-farm composting? And these are some of the things that me and my team and, and others have come up with with what's needed to expand on-farm composting. So we clearly need clear definitions, rules and pathways for scaling responsibly. Um, this um, source separation and keeping clean stocks, keeping clean feedstocks clean, I like that, clean twice, that's very important, quality standards for compost and soil amendments, demonstration projects, partnering with research institutions, financial support, education. So I know Vermont is already, there's a lot happening um, to promote on-farm composting. Can it grow? Undoubtedly. Um, this graph shows the impact of Austria's source separation mandate on the amount of food scraps and other organic waste that the country is collecting. And the spike, um, the spike after 2017 comes from improved data collection, by the way, via the uh, implementation, they have a national electronic waste management reporting system. But you can see here that it really spiked after their food waste, bio waste ordinance um, for introducing separate collection recycling really came into effect. So um, one of the things we've been looking at is what other states are working in this space to promote on-farm, not only composting, but the use of compost. And the California Healthy Soils Program, it has an incentives program, uh, provides farmers and ranchers with incentives to adopt soil health practices. And they have a demo projects program that funds on-farm soil health demo projects. 
both are run by the California Department of Ag, but composting, I know this is probably hard to read, but composting is consistently the top healthy soil practice being implemented by farms receiving funding through the California Healthy Soils Program. This is the number of demonstration projects, compost is high, and the percentage of incentive projects, you can be in more than one of these, but just wanted to share that. And this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but I just want to say that one of the things um, that's a problem with corporate concentration and consolidation is that it reduces innovation because there are just literally fewer companies competing and coming up with new ideas. You know, our supply chains become highly concentrated and so forth. But in Vermont, you have um, a number of innovators and AgriLab Technologies is one of them who is working directly with farmers to capture the heat off the compost piles to heat farmhouses and barns. And um, I know that Brian Jarose is a panelist, probably not talking about this, but a panelist in the next session. So just to call out to AgriLab and Galen Brown, who wrote the compost powered water heater. So some of these are pretty low tech solutions, but innovation is important. Another reason uh, to fight corporate consolidation. So I want to mention, share that at the ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative, which I head up, we have been doing an on-farm composting and compost use webinar series. So that model that I shared uh, from Aust Austria was featured in a webinar we did last November on the role of farms in decentralized composting. And we also featured Spain as well, by the way. So do check that out. Uh, we have a podcast. Uh, we do a number of infographics if any of you uh, want access to anything we're translating them into different languages if that's a need but one thing we also have is a community composting 101 101 online certificate course and i know Alyssa mentioned vermont's uh training and i know that the uh, cav also has a community composting online course uh, this is just something else to add to the tools in your toolbox. But the reason I'm mentioning it today is that this is next week starts um, International Compost Awareness Week, May 7th to 13th. And we do have free enrollment for this self-paced online course starting on Sunday. So um, just check that out if you're interested and help us spread the word. It's free enrollment for um, um, folks in region EPA region one, which in, obviously includes Vermont and the Mid-Atlantic region as well. So some of the posters that we've been promoting um, on composting, one is just on the benefits to soil. And we now know that soil carbon stocks are improved through changes in soil organic matter. And of course, compost is a key way to add organic matter to soils. And it is organic matter is a reservoir for that organic carbon. It's where the biological activity is, the nutrients. It's really a foundation for many ecosystem services and soil functions. And this was pointed out in an April 2022 University of Vermont Extension research brief called Soil Carbon Storage and Sequestration in Vermont Agriculture. And that brief pointed out that soil organic matter levels of five to seven percent are reali realistically achieved for farms in Vermont. I understand it's currently at 4.3 percent, the soil orga organic matter levels, but evidence says that getting to nine percent exists. So the other thing about soil carbon, it's strongly linked to many societal, societal and farm scale co-benefits. So it is the foundation of, of soil health and it can enhance climate resilience and water quality and farm productivity. So soil, as we know, that's why we're here today. It's um, for healthier soil, healthier food. Compost is the theme of this week's conference. And some of the other work we've been doing, as Natasha mentioned in intro to me, is documenting the jobs through composting. This is a poster that's available that shows that for every 10,000 tons of waste per year going to incinerator, you may have one job, landfilling, it's two, but making compost, it's at least four times the number of jobs, but composting is not a linear kind of materials destruction <laughs> uh, process. So you're making a product and when that product goes into green infrastructure like bioswales or rain gardens, you have an additional six times the number of jobs for every 10,000 tons flowing into compost facilities. So check that out. Um, this is um, a series of 
uh, infographics that are available as, as individual squares that we did for International Compost Awareness Week a few years ago, just kind of boiling down the benefits of compost to reduce your waste, enhance soil, grow your community, and protect the climate. And then last year, you'll have to look at this um, online at the link because I know it's probably hard to read, but this is a kind of taller infographic on how composting combats the climate crisis. And, you know, I mentioned sequestering carbon and soil quality and we know about avoiding you know landfill methane emissions but building community resilience isn't often talked about and that's part of what we tried to capture here and one thing i'll just say if you all are not aware of it is that the inflation reduction act earmarked millions if not a few billion dollars for reducing climate pollution so really make sure your climate action plans include nature-based solutions such as composting might be able to open up some funding for your projects. So um, we, you know, have done uh, many reports, including Stop Trashing the Climate, which was one of the first to highlight the importance of getting organics out of landfills. I mentioned growing local fertility that we did with the Highfield Center for Community Composting. And what I wanted to share about this is that after that report came out in 2014, we were just contacted by dozens of groups all across the country there was when are you doing the next one brenda we want to be included so this helped us form our community composter coalition and we've now been tracking community composters on a map as well as uh, policies and um and i just want to kind of give you a flavor for some of the groups we have in new england uh peels and wheels composting that's one of our bike haulers and they're pedal powered food scrap collector they compost at local farms and they're, the compost is used not only at the farms, but at community gardens. And um, the surplus goes to participating house, households. The Community Compost Depot in Providence is um, serves about just one depot, 400 residents. And um, they're available to folks, regardless of their ability to pay for services, which is not often the case. Park City Compost Initiative in Bridgeport, Connecticut started as a neighborhood composting effort to reduce incineration pollution. Um, and now they have expanded into a pilot with larger composting capacity and they build bins, they teach high school students how to compost. Um, groundwork, harvest cycle compost, and again in Rhode Island, they're another one that's using bikes to collect food scraps for residents, restaurants, and institutions and their compost goes to urban growers in their community. And one of the things I think that's notable about groundwork is that they're involving youth and ad adult employment programs in both the collection processing and their food growing uh, operations. You can kind of see some of that there. Um, Bootstrap Compost is a for-profit food scrap collection service. It operates in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, but they're a social enterprise. So they pay its employees competitive livable wages with benefits and their compost also goes back to the uh, their customers and their uh, part of their core mission is educating the community about composting. Um, Zero Cooperative is a work on cooperative in Dorchester, Massachusetts. It's bilingual, multicultural, um, and it provides services for a wide range of clients in Metro Boston. And they also have a network they were with the network of local farms to compost and then the compost is obviously used in local food production so they're an environmental justice and, um, organization and very much zero waste is part of their mission and then here in vermont you guys are lucky to have tom gilbert with black dirt farm in northeast kingdom and uh you know there is i think most of you may already be familiar with black dirt they family farm and they don't just make compost. They have a chain of custody over the entire process. They're kind of stewarding food scraps. And one of their newest um, endeavors is this idea of community compost pods that they got a small grant from Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. It was $5,000 when I talk about a small grant to develop and establish you know, these kind of neighborhood depots. It's really kind of simple concept. And I think each depot supports about 20 households a week. And, and they're piloting this in the hard work, hard, hard work um, area. But uh, anyway, lots of, um, of uh, stuff happening in Vermont. Now these, we on our map, we have kind of growing community gardens, farms, 
co-housing complexes that we've tracked. I mean, Natasha, my goodness, you're working with so many of these of these groups on their small scale sites. And I'm sure that you would say the potential to expand is enormous. One of the things we just released um, uh, in March was a census of community composters around the country. And one of our findings is that the growth is tremendous. We're seeing that over 90% of the program started since 2010 and over half since um, 2017. And it continues to uh, continues to grow. We asked our respondents, you know, which of these categories types of programs they offer, if they're offsite or drop off or farm or garden. Uh, how they would describe themselves, they could select more than one option. And 37% identify as farms and 27% identify as community gardens. So there's a lot of potential to grow community composting at the local level. And the number of composting methods used very varied as well. They were using windrows and vermicomposting and, and uh, batch systems. They're, some of them are incorporating Bokashi, and most of them are using more than, um, or a lot of them are using more than one method as well. So, and then one thing I wanted to share because Vermont is part of that uh, kind of cohort of states that has banned large food waste generators from disposing of food waste. They have to do something with it, as you all know. And increasingly, we're seeing our community composting small scale being able to handle uh, materials from from restaurants we have 20 to 40 percent of the respondents in our survey are taking from um, supermarket chains and small grocery stores and hotels and uh, retreat centers and the like so that's that's growing you know a lot of them are doing events offices residential curbside drop-off um, and then they in terms of um of where the end use is going, 85% say it's going to gardens, home-based or community gardens, 50% of respondents uh, farm soil and um, and other give kind of client give back programs. So they are increasingly handling larger accounts, but returning it to the community. And in terms of the community impact, we're seeing um, 82% of community sites are located within areas served by um, collection. 72% use some, most of all of their product on site. 71% are providing community engagement opportunities. And that can include uh, having volunteers and harnessing volunteer, the power of volunteerism to have, you know, build this fabric of um, the community that I've been talking about. And more than three quarters have active employees that they're supporting. But one of our key findings is also that there are many other co-benefits of local composting, public health, community building, other environmental benefits. And those include things like greening and beautifying neighborhoods or providing um, community gathering spaces. Increasing prosperity for local farmers is really important. Uh, one thing that has not been talked about a lot about is just this idea of creating opportunities for marginalized groups things, uh, groups like engaging at-risk youth or providing jobs for people who have barriers to traditional in employment. So what are the trends that we're seeing? Well, you know, I'm, I'm sad to share that a lot of the trends, while we're seeing a growth in community composting, we're also seeing a trend towards large centralized and consolidated facilities. So the trend in many communities to give everyone a toter and collect it and take it to a faraway centralized compost site. San Francisco and Seattle were early adopters of citywide food waste collection, but they relied on large scale sites. And in the US, um, managing waste is a $76 billion industry where over 50% of landfill volume is controlled by just three companies. Republic is one of them. Uh, waste management and waste connections are the other two. And we're seeing uh, these companies expand into organics recycling. Uh, Republic just announced last week that they're opening a new anaerobic digestion facility so, um, in California. But 
the th top three big trash corporations, you know, established their market dominance by ensuring consolidation across services. Not only do they own the collection routes and the right to haul and the landfills, but they maximize profits through fees at each of these stages. And they've created this land landscape where they profit at the curb, they profit at processing and transfer stations and at disposal sites, and they are paid to remove economic and environmental benefits from communities and then use those profits to gain more industry control. And we should not be blind to that fact. Um, Vanguard Renewables owns and operates six anaerobic digesters in the Northeast. They have 10 new facilities under construction and they plan to develop 100 projects by 2025. And last July, they announced that a fund managed by BlackRock Real, real assets acquired the company to help it move towards the commission of those 100 new project, projects. Now, BlackRock Real Assets is the real estate and infrastructure investment arm of BlackRock. And that is an investment management company with nearly 10 trillion in assets under management. That is more than the GTP of every country in the world, except for the United States and China. And it is the shareholder across a wide range of global industries that include oil and gas, retail, big banks, healthcare, weapons manufacturing. And all of that makes BlackRock one of the most powerful corporate actors on the planet whose influence literally touches every aspect of our daily lives. And it was nominated last year for the Corporate Hall of Shame by our friends at um, Corporate Accountability. And so they prop up the fossil fuel industry, the tune of $250 billion investments in corporations that are propelling climate catastrophe. So it's something to keep in mind um, how, who owns the, um, the infrastructure, what are their goals and what are, their do, what are they doing? Now in Vermont, all trash goes to single landfill owned by Casella Waste, Waste in Systems which now is a $4 billion enterprise spanning much of the Northeastern US with collection routes, recycling facilities, transfer stations, and landfills. And just last week, they announced their largest acquisition in years for $525 million in assets from GFL Environmental. So this is gonna expand their reach into Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, where I am. Now, uh, Vermont Public Radio did a um, did a um, trash empire series on about Casella's dominance in the Northeast um, and how it's leading to monopoly concerns in Vermont. And uh, one of the things that I have learned is that Casella previously hauled most of its organic material to a district-run local composting site, but those shipments have dropped off. This is uh, according to the district's um, own data. And um, does Casella privilege large partners, not only themselves, but Purpose Energy, other waste to energy and AD facilities over local businesses? How can smaller businesses compete? And I'll just submit to you that democracy is not just political, as my colleague Stacy Mitchell likes to say, it's also economic. When there's too few companies in one industry after another that call all the shots, that's not good for us economically and it's not good for us as a democracy. And corporate consolidation is suppressing wages, it's breaking supply chains, driving inflation, and the result of unchecked monopolies is a more fragile economy and a less democratic society. And we're seeing a trend as well with depackagers and large sites. They're competing with local operators. We did a podcast on that called Stop Privileging Large Industrial Sites Over Local Composters. I interviewed Tom Gilbert and, um, and Laura Holmes, Tom Gilbert from Black Dirt Farm and Laura Holmes from Zero Cooperative, who I mentioned earlier. Check that out. But as we see more packagers, um, so do concerns over microplastics contamination. Um, come up and surface, as we all know. And one of the things I thought was interesting in this, this article, the Waste Dive did, is that uh, there was a little bit pushback on the depackager saying, well, that America has an addiction to cheap food wrapped in plastic. 
And, you know, that's one of the causes. And I will say I agree with that. Back to my point, as I started with, with the dollar stores, you know, but it's not necessarily we have an addiction. It's that that we are privileging those chains being built and we're not don't have the rules to counter that kind of corporate um, concentration. So I know um, kind of running shorter time, Natasha, I know I have about three more minutes, so I'm going to probably skip a few slides and get to my conclusion here. But I just want to point out that in that article, I did mention that it's better to keep our organic materials clean and segregated in order to have higher value end products, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So I think we can all agree with that. And as um, we are looking more and there's research being done, there's more research coming about microplastics and PFAS. This was um, one study that was done in Vancouver, British Columbia, where they looked at uh, plastics and their compost collected. And I thought this was just an interesting image to share, actually a very sad one, that a bathtub full of compost would contain one plastic grocery bag equivalent of microplastics. And the research that the University of Vermont's been doing, this has been funded in part by Casella um, to test the efficiency of new of their depackaging systems, you know, has also found, um, you know, obviously that there's microplastics and whatnot in there. So more research is clearly needed. Some of the pushback has been that the plastic makes its way into agricultural soils from various sources like mulch and irrigation systems and farm equipment and even litter. But the existence of a problem is not a reason to make it worse. And if we already have a problem of plastics entering soils, it's even more vital to have strict standards about what we spread on farms. I'm going to skip the PFAS because I think you guys are familiar with that. It was mentioned already by Alyssa, the draft policy for source separation of food residuals, um, which I think is very positive that this was released in February, that source separated food residuals shall not be mixed with heavily packaged food residuals at the point of generation. And this is a question I don't know the answer to, but are there rules for what happens with the depackaged food? I understand that, for instance, at the Purpose Energy Facility, which is in South Burlington, the depackaged food is blended with, with watery waste from the multiple, multiple brewers, distillers, and food manufacturers. And that Purpose Energy is th three more digesters in development in Vermont. So what are the rules at the end of it? So. Vermont is already beginning to say no to single use plastics, which is good. I mean, you know, what a few years ago, um, Senate Bill 113 banned, you know, the plastic carryout bags and imposed the 10 cent fee. So moving in the right direction. But I really think that single use food service wear has got to go. Um, there's plenty of examples around the world and new. Um, new research and businesses and enterprises that are kind of demonstrating this. I love that this um, was something I came across a while ago, but that this Tiffin Containers Indian Meal Service is so efficient. It's the envy of FedEx. So and, and in India, there's another example, this community crockery bank, um, which just, you know, some of the festivals in India, they have what tens of thousands of people, but they're able to do reuse at public festivals. And they've just been growing across the country and uh, so many great stories and events and involving kids in the washing. And right here in Vermont, um, Tom Gilbert shared, shared this in a talk he gave to our Community Composting Coalition that uh, a number of years ago, Tiny Hardwick, broke a Guinness World Record of the largest community dish washing at the same time. And I uh, just thought that was so much fun. Um, this was back in 2017 at their annual spring spring fest. But you know, if we're not banning, if we're still able to get this in our supermarkets, uh, I think, and it's still on the shelves, is uh, really an issue. A visit to any supermarket, drugstore, department store reveals Many products and packaging produced and sold with literally no thought to durability, waste prevention, or you know, recyclability design. And you know, that this was true in the 70s and 80s is no surprise. What is really surprising to me is the lack of, of change. And I'll just share that we really can learn from the experience with single stream recycling and the trends in other states where we put all the recyclables in one bin. Um, which really was at the, at the 
push of dominant waste management corporations and recycling went to larger industrial materials recovery facilities and um, and the markets dried up and we had contamination and so we for let's not have this happen to organics recycling we need to source separate we shouldn't privilege the dominant corporations and we need to be wary of depackagers they're part of the toolbox but um there's a role for them, but we really need to minimize and avoid contamination. I think reuse is one way to go. So what role should compostable wear play? That's a really good question moving forward. Um, this um, upstreamsolutions.org has some information about how Oregon composters don't want compostable packaging. Black Dirt Farm doesn't want compostable packaging. Um, new research on how compostable food containers can release PFAS. And the good news is, is that reuse is taking off. Um, reuse saves businesses money and reduces waste 100% of the time, which I think is just great. We have cities like Re uh, Seattle that have embracing reuse and moving away from single use products in cities like where I, where I am close to Washington DC it's a smaller program but it's called ditch the disposables and they're giving grants out to churches and caterers and um, other food service places to put in dishwashers and get equipment and do outreach and education so there's a lot of movement and one of the things I saw was in a giant food store here in DC they announced a partnership to pilot in two food stores um, reusable packaging in return. Now it's not ideal. I don't know what their stats are on that, but we weren't seeing this 10 years ago. So this is all new. So I'll just say, kind of conclude with what can you do? Let's pay attention to monopoly power. Let's foster diversified infrastructure. That means policies, investment, partnerships, tools, technical assistance. We need to focus on protecting soils, eliminating contaminants, following the precautionary principle, reserving depackagers solely for heavily packaged goods. Don't forget to contract with the small guys. Farmers are important. And I'll just end with embrace a holistic framework that could be local food systems community. Maybe it's creating local communities in organics recycling. You know, those of us in this field, um, we're, we're here, touching here, but healthy folks working in healthy soils, maybe we're kind of touching the elephant <laughs> down on the foot down here. Um, maybe those of us working on local economic development, you know, are touching the elephant on the tail. Those who care about public health, the PFAS, the microplastics, um, the contaminated water, we're up here touching the elephant. Those who care about community building are over here. But really, this is the the parable of the blind man and elephant and that's the story of a group of blind men who have literally never come across an elephant before and who learn and imagine what the elephant is like by touching and each of those uh blind each of them feel like a feel a different part of the elephant's body like we're doing here but um only one side and the the moral of the parable is that humans have a tendency to claim absolute truth based on their limited subjective experience and they ignore other people's limited subjective experience which which may be equally true but it limits our perception and it limits the importance of a complete context so um things feel differently and so we can't let centralized food scrap collection go the go the same way um as recycling did we have the benefit in our field of connecting with healthy food soils, food security, agriculture, all of these things. And we can bring them together to embrace a system that's composting for people on the planet. And in order to do that, it's really important that we think about food systems and that we not get siloed into composting or farming or emissions reduction or whatever. And Vermont's Protect Our Soils Coalition is really doing just that. They're bringing together environmental groups, with individual operators and farm advocacy groups. And um, they're working to uh, build healthy soils, healthy community, um, and strengthening, I would say, keep it local, strengthen local communities as the guiding foundation. And we can't have healthy food without healthy soil. And we need to develop this kind of intellectual framework 
and solutions at the local level. So let's seize this opportunity to recenter organics recycling on these kind of foundational principles and laws. And, um, and uh, we'll be talking about all this this week. And I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Brenda. Yeah. Um, you teed up the rest of the program very nicely, Brenda. In fact, tomorrow is uh, well, we have a number of programs this uh, sessions this week that are focused on on-farm composting, but tomorrow is probably the biggest lineup of um, the Composting Association of Vermont's on-farm composting project um, with some partner farmers from Vermont and New Hampshire. And then we're going to hear from the um, Vermont Department of Ag on the work that they're doing. And, uh, and then also, I love how you tied in um, the use of compost, right? So that's what we're actually going to be hearing about um, at three o'clock tomorrow as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just bring up one final slide. And if you guys, just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Brenda or for Alyssa, um, feel free to put them in chat. I'm keeping an eye on that. And um, let me see about bringing up this last slide. It's just a little promo for the rest of um, the next session today. Oops. Sorry, folks, but feel free to type stuff in as I'm bringing this up. If you have any, do have any questions? You're getting a lot of nice presentation comments, Brenda. Um, all right. Uh, So um, just to let folks know that it, uh, the 3 p.m. session today is expanding site capacity by adding aerated composting to turn window operations. And um, Brian Jaros uh, from AgriLab Technologies that Brenda gave a, a shout out to, as well as Bob Spencer are gonna be featured in that session. Yeah, and also just because uh, Brenda, you mentioned Sarah a couple times, um, a, a session that was added a little bit late to our program on Friday at 1 p.m. features Saro as one of the panelists, Josefina Luna from, from Saro will be sharing with us as well. So hope you all can join us throughout the week. We do have one comment saying that they'd love to learn more about stopping the big box corporations. I don't know, Brenda, if you wanna to touch on that just briefly, it's a little off topic, um, but all related as you were saying. Yeah, we have um, a lot of information on our website right on how to stop big box corporations. In fact, my colleague, Stacy Mitchell, wrote a report a number of years ago called, called Big Box Swindle. So um, just check that out. And it's ilsr.org is the website. And they have a, Brenda, you have a great um, search function. So you can also go on there and search and all kinds of things will come up that are related to the many different topics that Brenda talked about. I also just wanna tell you, um, Brenda, that we use your infographics, ILSR's infographics all the time. They're fabulous resources. So if folks have not seen those, or if you're looking for a really nice overview of, of uh, you know, a composting system or the benefits or you know, any of these things, um, you can find those on their website as well. Well, thank you so much to participants today, all of you for joining us. Brenda, thank you for the, giving the keynote presentation this year and Alyssa for the State of the State of Organics. We really appreciate your time and, and it's great to learn from you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.